Good afternoon, ladies and men. We are so pleased to gather together again and have a chance to eat. We are going to begin the, uh, the afternoon remarks and uh, keynote presentation. Uh, before we, uh, we bring up our, our keynote speaker, I would like to introduce Mally, Mary Alice Williams, who is here with us today from the Nokomis Foundation, one of our sponsors. The Nokomis Foundation has been working here in West Michigan for many years on women and girls uh, justice issues and empowerment opportunities for, for women. And uh, they have invested very heavily in, uh, in recent years in women's environmental health and empowerment issues at the University of Michigan. So there's a very beautiful tie-in uh, between the work of Dr. Steingraber and the Nokomis Foundation's efforts in our community. And we're very thankful for all of their investments. We're also thankful for our friends at the Wakey Foundation and Grand Valley State University and all of the organizations that help to sponsor this work. So, um, Mary Alice, if you can join me, I'll introduce you. Mary Alice is a longtime activist, never afraid to say what she thinks <laughs> and to say it loudly yeah. and explicitly. <laughs> so nobody's confused walking away from her words. <laughs> she is a mentor to many of us in the room, one of the city's first female city commissioners and a longtime executive director of Arbor Circle, an institution that helps to support individuals um, as they solidify their, their lives and move forward with their personal goals. And I'm incredibly honored to uh, have her join us today to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you, everyone. It's great. It's great to see um, so many people with an interest in the issues facing us environmentally at this time. And I'm hoping that um, after you hear our keynote speaker, you will be motivated um, to move beyond uh, learning about the issues and doing something about them. I think that that's her message. Um, I'm grateful to be here. I thank everyone, as Rachel did, who sponsored this. And I, I want to tell you how pleased I am um, to be able to introduce uh, Dr. Steingraber. She is a world-renowned ecologist, as most of you know, know, with a PhD from the University of Michigan. She is an international authority on the links between environmental issues and depredation and human health. In her critically acclaimed book, Living Downstream, an ecologist's personal investigation of cancer and the environment, she describes how her personal experience as a cancer survivor frames and informs <coughs> her environmental studies. And I think that the gift that she brings to all of us who are maybe not as uh, compelled by compelling data is that she's able to weave the science and those human stories together in a way that puts a fine point on what's at stake for all of us. In her books, Having Faith, An Ecologist's Journey to Motherhood, and the book Raising Elijah, Protecting Children in an Age of Environmental Crisis, she has united her scientific research with that lived experience so that all of us can learn both from the data and from her stories and project our stories into that equation, I think. Most compelling and instructive to those of us who would call ourselves environmentalists, <coughs> Sandra has moved beyond coupling scientific evidence with those compelling stories to engage recently in acts of civil disobedience, linking the environmental justice movement with the human rights movement and all causes which ultimately came to the conclusion that all too often, sadly, we have to move outside of what our legal system provides, what the conventional wisdom provides, and really stake everything on putting not only our mouths but our bodies where we believe um, 
there are essential matters that need to be addressed in our society. She spent 15 days in jail um, as she grappled with uh, protecting the New York Finger Lakes region from the industrialization and chemical exposure tied to high volume horizontal, horizontal fracturing. And I know she'll be talking more about that um, in her remarks. At, your program says that Sojourner Magazine called her a poet with a knife. I heard her speak a couple of years ago in Washington and again last night to a group of about 100 women who had gathered um, through Progressive Women's Alliance. And I will tell you that while she's still a poet with a knife, I think she has moved into the realm of being a prophetic voice um, in the classical sense of, of how we name prophets in our midst. And she calls us to move into a realm of action that has pretty high stakes for us personally, but that's what we're called upon to do, she believes, when the high stakes are so great for our children, for future generations, and for the planet. So it is my distinct honor to introduce Sandra Steingraber to us and hope that you will listen attentively with both your mind and your heart to what she has to say. Well, never a more lovely introduction. Thank you, Mary Alice. I hope to live up to it. Um, so my task today is actually to talk with you about um, the role of women in science and women leadership in the environmental movement. And uh, I'm going to do that, um, but I, I will begin um, by speaking out of one of my other identities that Mary Alice just referred to, which is my identity this year as a woman inmate in the Shaman County Jail. Uh, so uh, I'm going to begin with a short <coughs> reading, and I'm, uh, it's from a, an essay I published called Coffee in Jail. Uh, and I'm going to interweave this essay, various excerpts from it throughout my talk, and I'll begin with it. There is no coffee in the Shimung County Jail. There used to be coffee. Also, parenting classes, drug counseling, and the opportunity to purchase from the jailhouse commissary packages of new underwear as a private alternative to the holy, blood-stained, ratty-ass drawers that are standard issue. But the new sheriff has put a stop to all that. So said the women of cell block 5D at about 6.30 a.m. I myself had become a woman of cell block 5D at about 3.30 a.m., so the coffee situation caught my attention. The fact that I found it more alarming than the underwear situation says something about me that my mother would not find admirable. <laughs> The Shimung County Jail is located in Elmira, which is wholly situated within the Shimung County, uh, the Shimung River floodplain along New York's border with Pennsylvania. Elmira was once the writing home of Mark Twain. Here was a fact to inspire me. But the city is otherwise most famous for repeated floods and for its notorious prison camp. Fully one quarter of the 12,000 captured Confederate soldiers that were held as inmates in Helmira died during the final months of the Civil War, presumably not from unspeakable underwear. <laughs> my fellow inmates looked in at me through the bars of my cell and continued their briefing. Until tested for tuberculosis, all incoming prisoners are classified as keep lock, which is to say they have to remain inside their cells. The TB t test takes 48 hours to administer and read, but medical personnel are not available. Budget cuts, baby. Thus, new admits can end up in 24-7 keep lock for up to 15 business days pursuant to 7.13.8B of NYNRDD9. 15 days was the entire length of my sentence. Look, said an inmate named Nadine, we'll be bringing you your meals and stuff. What do you need? I blinked through a coffeeless stupor, some paper, a pencil, the Bible. Thanks so much. I want to speak today as a kind of uh, emblem of our environmental situation, but also 
literally as the source of all of what I think of all of our problems is going forward right now at this particular moment in human history in the in speaking about it, the environment. And, and that is a form of fossil fuel extraction that's new on the horizon, it's sweeping across the nation. The, its official name is high volume slick water horizontal hydraulic fracturing, um, but it's typically referred to by the shorthand fracking. It's a form of fossil fuel extraction that turns the earth inside out and buries a resource that is vital to life, namely our fresh drinking water, uh, and brings to the surface a subterranean, subterranean substances, uh, hydrocarbons, methane of course is the quarry here, methane being natural gas, um, but also radioactive materials that are necessarily bound up with the natural gas in the shale, uh, heavy metals and brine, that were once locked away in ge ge geological strata and which now <coughs> will require, once we bring them up to the earth, permanent containment forevermore somewhere. And we, have we haven't solved that problem at all. In fact, it's an unsolvable problem, what to do with all that toxic flowback. Mm -hmm. Now, fresh water, remember, uh, is a tiny percent of the total water on our planet. 98% of the water on our planet is ocean, the seawater. 2% is fresh water, but half of that, 1%, is bound up as ice at the polar ice caps. So only 1% of all the water on Earth is available to us as fresh drinking water. So all of our blood plasma, the sap inside trees, all the juice inside fruits, every single raindrop that becomes part of the food we eat, that is uh, literally, the, the water is the 1%. Um, and so that then is uh, the club by which hot fracking seeks to use to smash apart the bedrock beneath our feet um, to extract a hydrocarbon. And before it is sent down the borehole, that 1% of the world's fresh water used to fracture bedrock is mixed with inherently toxic materials. These include known and suspected carcinogens, neurological toxicants, and chemicals linked to pregnancy loss. At least 1,000 different truck trips are required to frack a single well, and these trucks, along with earth-moving equipment, compressors, condensers, and all the ancillary infrastructure that necessarily accompanies fracking, um, releases or creates soot, volatile compounds, and ozone, we know with certainty that exposure to this kind of air pollution has demonstrable links to asthma, so that becomes now a child welfare issue, fracking. It's linked to stroke and heart attack and cancer risk, so that becomes a public health threat to all of us adults. And also now we have emerging data linking fracking to preterm birth, low birth weight, um, low APGAR score, and most recently on a published study just a few weeks ago, uh, increased risk for cardiac birth defects among newborns. So now we're talking about uh, reproductive rights, right? A woman's right to plan her parenthood, carry out a pregnancy without other people's chemicals interfering with it. So th this is now, I think you begin to see why I believe that uh, fracking is not only just a symbol of our current uh, environmental situation, but also quite literally represents a huge emerging threat to public health across the board to women, um, pregnancy, children, and with uh, links to heart attack and stroke risk, uh, risk to all of us throughout uh, our, our developmental lifestyle. So I want to explore some of the human rights dimensions in this talk um, that emerge um, from some of the, the data. So I'm going to kind of talk about the data, but also some of the um, uh, ethical implications uh, that arise. Um, and I'm particularly interested in asking, uh, how, what, what role do we play in looking at residents who are actually serving as involuntary subjects in an ongoing <laughs> uh, uncontrolled experiment? So are we going to insist that we study these folks, right, who, are being, who live near drilling and fracking operations and keep the fracking going in the meantime so we can understand better what the <laughs> health effects are? How does our moral obligation to prevent harm square with attempts to monitor the evidence for harm? What's the relationship between mitigation and asking for better regulation and simply saying this is inherently dangerous and it needs to stop and insist on primary prevention? When, when does research serve to sanction and legitimize polluting activities and when does it actually challenge them? There are no clocks in the Shimon County Jail and the fluorescent lights stay on all night. And so time was emancipated. In my six by seven foot cell, time escaped and spilled over everything. It ran wild and unmetered. I breathed time into my lungs. I ate time, I read time. Whatever I was doing, I was doing time. 
I was drunk with it, rich with it. I had enough of time. For once, I had enough time. Occasionally, I heard church bells and counted the hours. But a more reliable timekeeper was the window across the cell block, separated from me by two catwalks and two rows of bars. Its glass had been painted over, and I could not see beyond it to the outside world. And yet, each evening, soon after the dinner tray was collected, the a April light pushed through the panes, paint and all, and a diffuse ray of sunlight entered my cell. So scattered, it wasn't really a ray. It was an echo of light, a whisper of light, a cloud of light. Its daily arrival was like grace itself. So pay attention, Steingraber. I watched hard as the light glided across the near wall of my cell where the bunk was attached to the back wall, burnishing the steel toilet and sink, and then slid along the blank far wall, also steel and painted with beige enamel. One evening, I, paint, I placed my body inside this numinous spotlight and moved with it. It was while standing <laughs> against the illuminated far wall that I noticed a word. Just like that, I saw it. I was staring at a letter E. There was no mistaking it. And there was another E just to the left of the first one, and other different letters to the left of those. Each letter was about eight inches high, not drawn or engraved, but somehow pressed, pressed into the steel wall itself. Without the faint play of sunlight, I never would have noticed them. I discovered a petroglyph, a message written in invisible ink. I ran my fingers over each indented letter. I read this word by Braille. The word was not about God. The word was not about fornication. The word was coffee. No kidding. <laughs> I want to suggest a framework for the environmental crisis. Um, and I want to suggest that we think of the environmental crisis as a human rights crisis. Uh, and I, I want to submit first that the environmental crisis is actually two crises. It's like a tree with two trunks that share a common root. One trunk represents what's happening to our planet through the accumulation of heat trapping gases in the atmosphere. I know you've spent a lot of time this morning talking about that kind of trunk of the tree of crisis. And if you follow that trunk along, you encounter such endpoints as droughts, floods, dissolving coral reefs, and the fact that one in every four mammal species is now heading for extinction. The other trunk represents what's happening to us through the accumulation of inherently toxic chemical pollutants in our bodies. And if you follow that trunk along, you find asthma, pediatric cancers, early puberty, learning disabilities, testicular dysgenesis syndrome, breast cancer, and so on. The root of this tree is dependency on fossil fuels. So both of these crises have a kind of common source. When we light fossil fuels on fire, they're combustion byproducts, mainly carbon dioxide, or their uncombusted fugitive emissions, mainly methane, um, become greenhouse gases. So we know in, since the beginning of the de Industrial Re uh, Revolution, which is about 1750s where we date it, um, that the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere has increased by a factor of 40 because we have lit highly carbonized fossils uh, that were under the ground. We brought them out of the ground, lit them on fire, and uh, loaded up the atmosphere with carbon dioxide, which is an asymmetrical molecule, which means that when infrared light, which <coughs> comes in from the sun and then should bounce back into space, right, um, when it encounters a molecule of carbon dioxide, because of the asymmetry of the molecules, there's a vibration pattern in the molecules that allows the uh, infrared light to be absorbed, and so the heat is trapped into our atmosphere. So by raising the number of CO2 molecules in the atmosphere by 40 percent, we just increase the amount of heat that is then trapped in the atmosphere. And of course, it doesn't just raise the temperature gradually, <coughs> evenly across the planet. It does things like interfere with weather cycles, so the very bitter, um, uh, extreme winter that we're experiencing is partly because of the disintegration of the polar ice caps brought about by this trapping of, of heat. And so as the polar uh, system begins to fall apart, it's sending now these blasts of cold air our direction, right? Um, but uh, methane, which is uh, an unburned gas, um, it has increased in concentration since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution by a factor of three. So we've tripled the amount of methane in our atmosphere. And methane actually traps far more heat than carbon dioxide. It doesn't last as long. Carbon dioxide lasts 100 years in the atmosphere. So even if we stop burning coal, natural gas, and oil now, 
we're still in trouble, right, for a long time to come. Um, methane, on the other hand, only lasts for a couple of decades, but it's far more potent at actually trapping heat. Um, and so me reducing methane emissions actually gives us a stronger tool by which to reverse climate change because it has an immediate impact and because also um, it, it's so potent. Uh, all right, so that's the sort of uh, global warming issue in a nutshell. Uh, on the other hand, remember that we use fossil fuels to make all kinds of chemicals. Petrochemicals are made out of uh, mostly natural gas, but also, and, and it used to be coal, but we don't use coal so much as a feedstock anymore, except for things like mascara, which is coal tar. Um, but uh, we tend to use petroleum, oil, or natural gas to make synthetic chemicals. So when we do that, we often create toxic substances that tinker with cell signaling pathways, alter our gene expression in ways that place cells in the pathway to tumor formation, otherwise contribute to chronic illness, or alter the course of, of human development itself. So we tend to think about natural gas, methane, solely as a greenhouse gas, but in fact it's also the starting point for most plastics and also pesticides. It is the uh, feedstock that we, when we make anhydrous ammonia synthetic fertilizer, that's what it's made from, natural gas. So we talk about nitrogen in our drinking water supplies in rural areas, and it's linked to birth defects, uh, blue baby syndrome and other problems also, it's a carcinogen. We're talking about the starting point for all the problem is natural gas. That's, we, in fact, we use 5% of the world's natural gas is used to make anhydrous ammonia fertilizer. The credit cards in our wallets are made of PVC plastic, namely vinyl. Vinyl is made from natural gas. So all, all of this plastic that we're surrounded with began as bubbles of methane in deep geological strata. So there are two then connected crises, but they are populated um, by two different groups of scientists and activists both. So now I'm going to come back to this idea of women in the in climate leadership um, position. And I want to say, and it's based my, on my observation that the climate change world, both the science and the activists, is mostly dominated still by men. And we need to change that. Everybody in this room right now, we're, we're, gonna, we're, changing, we're changing it now. So you're all now, I deputize you. <laughs> All of you women out there are now deputized as climate leaders, and you're going to go out, and we're not going to be able to say anymore that men are just entirely leading the discussion. But heretofore, we mostly see ins very inspiring leaders, and I'm, you know, pals and friends and admirers of all these men. Uh, NASA climatologist James Hansen, of course, has led the way. Um, journalist Bill McGibbon, ecologist Carl Safina, uh, climate activist Tim Christopher, who did two years uh, recently in federal prison for his actions, he's now in divinity school, and so on. Um, and so what the language of climate change talks about is focused on the future, right? Um, and the human rights issue of concern is known as generational inequity. So in the words of um, my fellow ecologist and author, uh, Carl Safino, we're eating the lunch of those who come after us, and uh, future generations will likely not forgive us for our reckless ad addiction to fossil fuels. The world of toxic trespass and chemical reform activism, that's the other branch of the tree of crisis when we talk about, we worry about toxic chemical exposures and the, our, our unconsenting exposure to these things and what it's doing to our health. That world is largely led by women. Um, of course, Rachel Carson is our kind of um, mentor and, and original leader in all this, followed by Lois Gibbs of Love Canal um, as a guiding spirit. Um, and this movement really largely looks to the past, the historical past. We're worried about chemicals that were brought onto the market years ago without any advanced testing or demonstration of safety, and now they're being implicated in human harm. And the human rights issues of concern here in this world are the right to bodily integrity, the right to fri uh, free prior and informed consent. And I always go back to Carson um, whenever I'm thinking about toxic trespass because she really provided us, I think, not only with the data and the evidence, but with the language and the conceptual framework to really begin to approach these things from a meaningful way. And she's not quoted enough, I don't think, so let me, let me do that now and, and correct that. So here is what um, Carson had to say about uh, human rights and the environment. He, this is a quote from Silent Spring. If the Bill of Rights contains no guarantee that a citizen shall be secure against lethal poisons, distributed either by private individuals or by public officials, it is surely because our forefathers, despite their considerable wisdom and foresight, could conceive of no such problem. And then in her June 1963 congressional testimony, she said the following, I assert the right, to lo right of a citizen to be secure in his own home against the intrusions of poisons applied by other persons. 
I speak not as a, a lawyer, but as a biologist and a human being. I strongly feel that this is or should be one of the basic human rights. And then in her very final speech before her death from breast cancer to a group of 1,500 physicians in San Francisco in October 1963, she said this. Underlying all of these problems of introducing contamination into our world is the question of moral responsibility. The threat is infinitely greater to generations unborn, to those who have no voice in the decisions of today, and the, that fact alone makes our responsibility a heavy one. Civil disobedience like Planned Parenthood. Civil disobedience is like Planned Parenthood. The second word in the phrase doesn't exactly align with the first one. You search your conscience, you make a decision, you make preparations, you talk about your decision and your preparations <laughs> in meaningful ways to all concerned, and then comes the time for action. You leave the condom in the drawer. Or, you refuse the deputy's third order to get off the driveway. The driveway that's owned by the nation's <laughs> largest natural gas storage and transport company. The driveway that the truck with the massive drill head strapped to its flatbed wants to drive on right now. Either way, where you end up bears little resemblance to the circumstances that kicked it off. To wit, you leave the condom in the drawer. Twelve years later, your presence is required at a pet band performance in a middle school gymnasium, <laughs> which the property taxes on your mortgaged house have helped to pay for. The pep band concert is charming, but it's the exact opposite of condomless sex. And while there is a clear causal connection between A and B, you wouldn't exactly call it a plan. <laughs> Similarly, you might have strong spiritual and biological feelings about drinking water and the possible folly of storing explosive hydrocarbon gases from fracking operations beneath it, which is what they're doing where I live. And because of previous decisions, such as condomless sex, you might now have a child who depends on that water and the air above it, and who spends summer nights at a 4-H camp near the railroad tracks along which said explosive gases will be transported. And even though you've testified and written letters and submitted expert comments, the company might go on violating environmental laws, polluting the lake, blithely paying fines, and planning for expansions. And so, because you believe so strongly in the sanctity of water and loons and the beauty of the boy who plays percussion in the pet band, because he broke his jaw in a bicycle accident, he had to give up the trumpet, here you are in cell block 5D, far removed from lakes and loons and pet bands. The new skill you have acquired for Earth Day is how to safely descend a set of stairs wearing ankle manacles and handcuffs. The letter from the pet band percussionist said, Mom, I'm really popular now on account of you being arrested. <laughs> Nadine and the others laughed. You gangsta mama now. <laughs> During key block days, my bunk was my desk. I composed sentences while kneeling on the cement floor in an attitude of prayer. Behind me, the word coffee stood in for the real thing. Its author inspired me. The light that revealed the word to me inspired me. Who? Why? How? Keep writing. You have time. We have no energy plan in the United States, right? We have no deal that we're going to swap coal out for gas. It's very likely we'll frack ourselves and keep blowing up the mountains of Kentucky too and export all of it. We could keep the lights on with coal and sell the gas for export to China or to Europe where prices are many times higher. In fact, plans to do that are being laid right now um, as we attempt to liquefy natural gas um, through cryogenics and build ports um, in our major cities, including Baltimore, uh, and so give a passport to natural gas, selling it to Europe and Asia at prices far higher. <coughs> uh, the plan to store liquefied petroleum gas in the old salt caverns under Seneca Lake, that's the place uh, near where my son was born and where he goes to summer camp and why I was arrested, uh, it indicates that that is actually the de facto plan. Or it's possible we'll direct the excess gas into the chemical industry, we'll make more PVC floor tiles, more synthetic fertilizers, more pesticides, and so on, 
and then we'll all be exposed to more toxic ex uh, chemicals. Without a plan for carbon or a tax on carbon, the markets are going to have their own way with it. The second real world problem of debating whether coal or natural gas is better or worse for us is that it ignores the damage done in extracting the quarry. Fracking literally turns the earth inside out. It's a shock and awe operation. Fracking involves the massive movement of materials across state lines, millions of tons of sand, which are mined from open pits, billions of gallons of water, which exit the water cycle, millions of uh, tons of radioactive drill cuttings, all of which have to be buried in landfills somewhere, billions of gallons of brine and toxic wastewater, millions of diesel truck trips, thousands of compressor stations and condensers, all of which are emitting volatile organic uh, compounds, including formaldehyde and benzene, which is known to be linked to birth defects and childhood leukemia. The amount of fracking wastewater from New York State alone under the proposed build-out scenario would exceed 62 billion gallons. <laughs> All of that is radioactive, full of brine, heavy metals, and carcinogenic hydrocarbons. The technology does not exist to turn this water back into drinkable water. 62 billion gallons is the amount of water that flows over Niagara Falls in 35 hours. If you can imagine standing in front of Niagara Falls for 35 straight hours and watching every drop of water that flows over it, that's how much toxic waste water we will generate if we open New York State up to fracking according to the current proposal and all of it will have to be so safely contained somewhere forevermore. Fracking risks public health injury at every step. Open pit mining of frac sand in the Midwest <coughs> is flattening the sand hills of Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Illinois, so our sister um, states in the Great Lakes Basin are being wretchedly harmed by the mining of frac sand. So let me just go back and talk about sand as an important ingredient of fracking, because I think it's the, a piece that's really overlooked. So when we think about fracking, you know, you, you, you probably realize that we are uh, descending into uh, the shale uh, and, turn, and the drill is, goes then and is turned sideways and bores kind of horizontally like a robotic mole up to a mile or more horizontally. And we send explosives down the hole, blow up the shale, uh, and uh, using water under high pressure um, to keep the cracks open, then the gas that's trapped like a kind of fizz of champagne bubbles in the shale now is free to travel up, um, <coughs> up the borehole. But if that's all you did, fracking wouldn't work because as soon as the pressure went away, the lithostatic pressure of the earth, the mile or more of earth that sits over top of the so-called shale play, is going to take all those shards that you blasted apart and crunch them back together again and the ga gas bubbles are trapped once more. So essentially it's sand that's the agent of fracking, not the water. The water is the high pressure that cracks things open, but then you have to prop those cracks open. Um, and so the doorstop that you use is silica sand, because silica sand grains are the Samson of sand. It's strong enough uh, silica uh, as an element um, to form a sphere and resist crumbling when the lithostatic pressure of the earth bears down on it. And so you can shoot, you use the water to shoot the sand grains into the cracks, propping them open forevermore now. So whatever is in there, and that's not, it's more than just methane, it's um, all kinds of other hydrocarbons, uh, ethane, propane, and so forth that come up with the gas, but also radon, uranium, all kinds of other nasty things that have been trapped down there with the gas for 400 million years are now going to flow open. So we need massive amounts of sand, many railroad cars full of sand per shale field, and so that has to be mined somewhere, and it's being mined in the Midwest, mostly in sandstone areas with sandstone bedrock. So it's not just a shale bedrock that's being turned inside out with fracking. It's anywhere with a sandstone bedrock as well. And the people bearing the brunt of this now are in um, uh, east, western, eastern Minnesota and western Wisconsin and also my uh, hometown area of, uh, along the Illinois River Valley where there's uh, silica, sand, uh, silica sandstone that can be blown apart. Um, there is an immediate health risk with silica sand because it, silica dust is a carcinogen, a known human carcinogen. There's no doubt about it. Uh, it's like asbestos. It forms tiny particles that can lodge into your lung and cause lung cancer. Uh, it also causes silicosis, which is an autoimmune disease. And the problem with silicosis from a public health point of view is that it only takes a short amount of exposure to kick off an autoimmune response. So even after exposure ends, you might only work in the shale fields for a couple of months. Um, once it starts, it's progressive and turns kind of the business end of your lungs, the part that does oxygen exchange, into fibers. And then so you become increasingly, increasingly disabled until you can't breathe again. And so the amount of money simply spent on uh, workers' comp and disability and all the medical care so provided for 
what otherwise would be young, healthy people, workers, um, uh, is uh, an, an uncounted number. So far, the economic analyses do not include these things. And no one knows what the effect of silica dust exposure is on the communities that live near all this frac sand mining operation. We have never exposed four-year-olds or pregnant women or elderly people that already have emphysema or CPOD to uh, silica dust. We've only, we only know what happens to workers in, who are sandblasters or, or glass blowers, and we know how to protect them because they're only exposed eight hours a day, and we know what kind of respiratory equipment they can wear. But the amount of silica dust on a frac site is so great, so much clouds of this stuff are released that even ma any masks that we have, we don't have the technology to protect workers. And so NIOSH, the National Institutes of Health and Safety, the, uh, OSHA, all the worker health safety are quite alarmed about this. But what about the people who actually live there? They don't have any dust masks at all, and they're being exposed 24-7, and they include pregnant women and kids in preschool and everybody who lives in a community. Because we have no data, the default uh, assumption is that it must be safe. So under those guidelines, the state of Minnesota, Wisconsin decided not to regulate or even monitor uh, silica dust in neighboring communities because there is no evidence that it's harmful to people who live in the general community. Well, saying there's no evidence for harm because we've never done the studies is different than saying we've done the studies and concluded that there is no evidence for harm. But that's the sl rhetorical sleight of hand that th the state of Wisconsin is now um, getting away from getting away with this. And so we now have seen massive acts of civil disobedience, probably with more to come, from the mothers, from the mothers with small children, um, especially the Catholic community, interestingly enough. Um, I met with a lot of the, uh, the Catholic community when I was in Winona, Minnesota, um, have very strong feelings about right to life issues and the sanctity of life and so on. Uh, I would argue whether you are seeing this from a Planned Parenthood point of view, which would be my kind of cultural perspective on it all, as a, a, a right of women uh, and reproductive rights of women to not have their reproductive lives affected, or whether you look at it from a, a fetal sanctity point of view, we might be able actually to come to agreement on the idea that you can't just expose people to an inherently toxic substance um, without their consent in order to um, extract hydrocarbons out of the ground and make profits um, for the largest uh, industry in the world, namely the oil and gas industry. If you see fracking as a resistance is futile, unstoppable force, then your goals become chemical disclosure, <coughs> health registries, you ask for before and after groundwater monitoring, and you ask for closed loop systems. In other words, you ask for better regulations. So you find out fracking is coming to Michigan, which it is, and then you see you're offered a chance to sit down at the table um, as leaders in the environmental community, as funders, as citizen leaders, um, and, and have a conversation with industry and come to some kind of um, agreement about what the rules of the game are going to be. Uh, on the other hand, if you see fracking as ultimately a human rights violation and you feel morally obligated to speak out forcefully against it and turn scientific inquiry for a force to public protection, then you ha it leads you to ask for a ban. It leads you to say that regulations are a form of enablement and I want no part of that. We're closing the door on fracking completely in Michigan and I am going to use all of the resources in my organization to call for a ban on fracking. That's the moral choice that you're faced with right now. My least favorite word from the world of fracking is mitigate. The word actually has two meanings. It's usually used in its first sense, which is to make less bad. So the, so the kind of seductive argument here is that if you help us mitigate, if you help, you know, use your brain power and all your resources of your groups and organizations to mitigate the effect of fracking, figure out what the setback should be, you know, should it be, should you have frac well sites 400 feet from a house <coughs> or 700 feet from somebody's house and so on, um, do you ask for green completion and how much recycling should we demand and so on, um, then you are making fracking less harmful. Mitigated fracking may uh, indeed kill fewer people than unmitigated fracking, but it still kills more people than no fracking, and I would argue f killing people is still wrong. Uh, and whether those are people now or in the future generations um, is again the, the, the question that Rachel Carson calls us to. So there's no way that you can turn cement into an immortal substance with any regulations, right? So when you send a hole down to the shale bedrock that contains radioactivity and things like benzene and formaldehyde in addition to methane and you blow all that up and you put it under high pressure, 
the only thing that now stands between the atmosphere and all that stuff you just stirred up down there is a cement well casing. The only thing that stands between your drinking water and that whole mess down below is a cement well casing. Is it going to last forever? Well, no. Cement crumbles, it shrinks, it, it, uh, it's very good at withstanding compressive force. It's terrible at withstanding uh, torquing. It's not a good material. It, it will crack. And so if there are any micro seismic events, any earthquakes that come along, um, suddenly now you have snapped um, uh, and broken apart the only barrier you've, you've left in place between our atmosphere, our drinking water, and all this toxic stuff you've just injected into the ground. So even if the problem is not faced by us, will it be faced by our children's generation, our grandchildren's generation, um, as the steel and cement begin to fa falter? Um, the best data we have come from Pennsylvania showing that 5% <laughs> of wells fail immediately, um, with about somewhere between 30 and 60% failing after 30 years. All it takes is one failed well to, to ruin an entire aquifer. <coughs> Once an aquifer is ruined, there's no sunlight or running water to, uh, and turbulence to clean it up. We don't know how to clean up groundwater. We simply don't know. So uh, what are our moral responsibilities? Are we going to ask for better fracking, or are we going to ask for no fracking? In my mind, some things are good to regulate, some risks we have to take and we regulate them, like childhood vaccinations, like infant car seats. Uh, and some things can't be regulated like DDT, like lead paint, which we decided to ban, like smoking in airplanes. We tried hard to have you know, non-smoking sections in airplanes, and we finally decided that a regulatory approach to smoking in airplanes it made no sense. There was no technology known that we could use to separate airspace between smokers and non-smokers, so we finally banned smoking on airplanes. And I'm old enough to remember the brouhaha about that, where people said that it's not realistic to do it would increase you know, terrible airplane uh, safety problems, because what about all those pilots who are, are now uh, nicotine deprived and they would crash the planes and so on. It wasn't a realistic idea, um, but we got there. Uh, and I think banning fracking and uh, calling for renewable energy is a doable project and we are called uh, to that uh, position. So let's, but let's look at some of the tools of mitigation. What do they actually accomplish? If we disallowed open pits for wastewater, less benzene indeed evaporates into the air, but more benzene is then contained in the wastewater that then goes on to be buried in Ohio, which is where we're sending all the wastewater. We are just simply delaying its release. Newton's laws still apply. Mitigation can't make toxic material disappear. It just transfers it from one place to another. On the sixth day, I was released from Keep Lock, which meant between the hours of 6.30 a.m. and 9.30 p.m., I could saunter up and down the catwalk and perch on the bolted down stools attached to the far row of bars. I could make collect phone calls. I could take a shower at will. Nadine said, let's celebrate. How about a cup of coffee? By which she meant black, lukewarm, instant decaf. Packets of Sanka were the sole form of coffee available from the commissary, and they came at a price, price gouging cost. She was offering me what little she had, doing the best she could which is the most that any of us can aspire to do in our efforts to make the world right, give everything we have. I said, yes. Thank you. So Rachel's going to tell us if we have some time for questions. OK, we do. Why don't you stand up so we can all, and say who you are, too. Sure. Okay, while we're doing that, let me, um, I have some really uh, specific ideas about uh, stopping fracking here in Michigan and about the ongoing study at the University of Michigan, my alma mater, which is going to be so determinative um, in uh, what's going to happen here. And I want to urge you all to be watchdogs of that study and also, um, make demands of what that study is going to uh, contain. Uh, and I'm interested in, um, in helping you do that. So if you want to ask me specific questions about that, I'm happy to take that. But I wanted to uh, make sure you all knew that here in the audience, and I'm hoping they'll stand up and say more about themselves, but I want to find my notes so I get the name right. Um, I don't see it, but I will try to say it. Here in the audience is one of the leading uh, members of the leading band group in Michigan, 
um, the committee to ban fracking in Michigan. I think that's pretty much right. And if you go to the website, let's ban fracking, there we go, let's ban fracking .org, um, that they can get you uh, LinkedIn. There's a big ballot initiative that's happening and so forth. So you'll be hearing more about it. I just wanted to flag it for your attention right now. So thanks you guys for, um, for coming here and we'll be here. Make sure you get a chance at the microphone. Okay, ready? I'm Allison Sutter. I think you addressed the question a little bit, but I would like to know where are we in the legal process right now? You said fracking's coming to Michigan. I'm um, a licensed attorney as well, so I know that the legal process is very long right. and enduring. So where are we and what type of opportunities do we have to get involved outside of participating with the organization? Okay, so I'm gonna make sure that those who really have their finger on the pulse um, answer that question specifically. So I'll answer it in general about what I know. So, and, and let me just be clear about what role I'm playing when I answer it. So. I am the science advisor for a group <coughs> called Americans Against Fracking. And so we are a national group attempting to um, work on a, a national moratorium on fracking, which is a very heavy lift right now, especially given the remarks you just heard the Obama administration make in the State of the Union. Um, so the, it's clearly the, at the level of the federal government, where it's a, uh, the EPA and the Obama administration are unfortunately wrong about um, their ideas that we can do fracking safely. Um, so the work of Americans Against Fracking then is to help um, states, individual states, do what they can to uh, declare a moratoria or get, gain a ban on fracking. One of our states, Vermont, has a ban, on, a permanent ban on fracking. Where I live now in upstate New York, we have succeeded in um, maintaining a moratorium on fracking. Here in Michigan, there is no ban or no moratorium, so nothing stops the industry from coming in and fracking you right now. And in fact, some of that's going on in a small scale way. Um, however, industry itself, uh, and, uh, and, and this, so there's, so, and, and let me just back up and say, so the state of Illinois is in a similar situation right now to where Michigan is at. Um, and in both states, um, the industry itself would like to have rules of the game um, because uh, fracking is uh, an activity where it only is profitable to them if you can do it in a massive way because you get so little gas from any one area, that they need to sort of massively roll it out. And, and of course, all this infrastructure comes along with it. They need to be able to, once the gas comes out, they have to uh, use condensers to take the gas, which is mixed with all these other hydrocarbons and these radioactive things and all the brine and the heavy metals. They have to separate that out. So you have to run kind of a giant distillery on site. And there are a lot of air emissions. Um, and, and so the question to the industry is, well, what can we release and what can't we release, right? Um, how much benzene, how much formaldehyde and all that. Uh, and then there are compressor stations, there are pipelines that have to be built, because this is just a, a big, these are, this is gas, so you have to have, can, you have to contain it, you have to be able to move it. Um, and so there are, uh, the industry itself would like the certainty of having rules and regulations in place before they move in here massively. So even though fracking is done maybe on a wildcatting kind of basis in a small way in here in Michigan, once the rules are in place, it will, go, it will then really open the state up. And so um, I think because the very sly nature of the industry and the way some environmental organizations were actually kind of ca themselves captured by the industry, including, sadly, the Sierra Club, right, which for years now we know took money from the gas industry, $25 million from Chesapeake Energy, to, to, and, and was helping go into states and open them up by sitting down and creating rules and working with legislators. Now the Sierra Club has backtracked and, say, and now they're opposed to gas, but they had to uh, do a 180 degree turn on that. So, but because of, we were all of us environmental leaders were kind of asleep at the switch, fracking got a toehold into all of these different states and the rulemaking process has begun before the people woke up and, and said, wait a minute, we don't want to rules on this, we just, we, we just don't want it. And so then the ban movement has had to try to catch up um, with the mitigation movement. And that's what we're seeing here in Michigan. So we had a couple of years now where we're talking about creating rules the results of the study that's going on in, in the University of Michigan about the environmental impacts of fracking should be determinative to what the rules would be, um, but we need to know what they're studying. You know, what's the scope of their study? Are they going to be looking at uh, health impacts? Because that, that, that's what we, in, in university, in, in New York, what we did, we ha also had a big environmental impact study that went on for years, and we flooded the, um, our state government with hundreds of thousands of comments complaining that we, th that that study did not take human health into account. So we actually then compelled the state government to stop and say, you're right, we didn't look at human health, 
and now they're doing a human health study that's been going on for a year and a half. We also have complaints about how that study is being done and what it includes and what it doesn't. So as, as um, my membership role in another group called Concerned Health Professionals of New York, we're watchdogging the human health study. Um, but I don't even know here in Michigan if there is a human health study component and if, the, for example, the uh, School of Public Health at University of Michigan should be deeply involved in not only determining what the human health impacts are going to be and project them, but then monetize them. What is the cost going to be if we uptick childhood asthma rates in uh, Michigan by, you know, half a percent? I mean, there's, there's, there are easy ways. Um, there are uh, numbers, statistical packages you can use to actually project those health care costs. What will it do to the Medicaid system, the Medicare system, the health insurance system? You know, how many um, on-the-job fatalities are we expecting? What about head injuries of workers and so on? This is an I industry. These jobs are killing jobs. They have a fatality rate of seven times that of other industries. And so that's something that we've been successful in talking with labor unions about. Um, is the high on-the-job fatality rate. So if you work in the fracking fields, your chance of dying on the job is twice that of a police officer, right? And then the chance of a maiming head injury that would uh, put you out of work for the rest of your life, silicosis, all these other things are also high. And so that also needs to be part of the economic analysis, as does what it does to property values. And so what we're seeing, because uh, you know, real estate is big in New, in New York, um, what we're seeing is that mortgage lenders are backing away from offering mortgages from properties near fracking operations. Um, it's actually illegal to, if you can lease your land, but if you store fracking waste, which is what inevitably happens, that's a violation of your property insurance and your mortgage agreement. So we now see the insurance industry paying attention and so on. And so um, the health issues, the property value issues, are, that also, they have, they're reciprocal, right? Because if your property values start to go down, your tax base starts to falter, then you have public health problems that emerge from lack of, of, of a tax base. Um, and then we also see social blight come in in areas that are heavily fracked. So we have some soci good sociological data now showing increased rates of crime, drunk driving, rape, um, increased rates of homelessness about among mothers who are single, uh, are single mother households uh, because the price of uh, rents go up very high because a lot of uh, out-of-state workers flood areas and so on. Uh, drug driving, um, violent victimization, gun, you know, lighting up the night with gunfire, all the things that go along with this industry um, uh, place economic costs, usually local costs, on taxpayers and law enforcement, and those too have, have health impacts, right? So if you have increased rate of teen pregnancy, which you do when fracking comes to a community, increased rate of sexually transmitted diseases and rape, those are all health issues too. So we were trying to get our elected leaders in New York to understand that the monetary costs have health consequences and the health consequences have monetary costs. So we're working with attorneys, people in real estate, um, as well as with physicians to explicate all these things. The problem, of course, is that fracking has the tempo and pace of fracking. It has this kind of gold fever mentality. So um, it, it's rolling out so fast that, and science is so slow um, that there's a disconnect between the pace and tempo of us being able to get the data before the elected officials as opposed to the claims of the industry, which mainly focus on these very temporary profits that are a part of the boom and bust cycle. What else? Yes. Um, I'm Ted Burkholz, and I'm the West Michigan Director for the League of Conservation Voters. Excellent. Full disclosure, before that, I was in the legislature for 14 years in Michigan, uh, state rep and state senator, and I was the author of a participation in the Great Lakes Compact. I have been very, very concerned about fracking since I first heard about it, mainly from a freshwater point of view, because we have 20% of the world's fresh water, right. and they aren't making any more water, right. and as you know, the, a lot from being from a Great Lakes state, a lot of the <coughs> western states are already coveting our water and have made no bones about the fact that they would like to pipe our fresh water to the western states. But I'm really concerned about the fracking, more concerned after hearing you, and thank you very much. Um, what happens to the, I mean, with all these chemicals, with the, uh, the former DNR director in Pennsylvania told me the, the reason they put their ban on fracking was because of the fact that the, they felt the, the initial fracking uh, projects that were going on had created the earthquakes they had. So that's opening up aquifers, it's opening up rocks that maybe haven't been opened up for 20,000 or a million years or whatever. I'm very concerned about the water part of it. And 
as well as the chemicals, do you see that as something that we need to even talk about more also? Because people in Michigan, you know, our, our fresh water is, is, our, is our ethos. It's our economic engine. It's what everybody, including Grand Rapids, use in their ads about coming to Michigan. Um, it's us. And I think sometimes the chemicals and the science and all that gets too convoluted for the average person to, you know, to grab onto and to think about. Do you see the fresh water issue as being part of this discussion too? And how would you frame that? Yeah, well, it's fundamental uh, to the issue. And in fact, we have new research um, just again, just coming out this week. Um, the Ceres Foundation actually helped underwrite some of this important research showing um, uh, water scarcity now in places where uh, fracking has happened in the, in the West. Uh, and so, so let me just back up and just frame this historically to say that um, high volume fracking combined with horizontal drilling is, in, is new. And the industry talks about fracking's been used for 60 years. Well, the, it depends on how you define the word fracking. Um, fracking, if you just mean fracturing, yes, it's not really new. Um, we used to attempt to locate bubbles of natural gas, large pockets under the ground, where um, for whatever reason the, the ground had shifted um, naturally in ways that allowed the gas bubbles to flow and then get trapped in a giant bubble. So we'd attempt to find those and then stick a cocktail straw down in the ground and up it would come and sometimes we would pour water and some chemicals down in the hole um, to stimulate more of that gas to come up. So that was in fact fracking and yes that's been going on for 60 years, but we've essentially run out of that um, conventional, uh, those big pockets are gone, we've burned through it all, and that's the meaning of a non-renewable resource, as in God's not putting any more of it in the ground, once it's burned, it's gone. And so now what the industry is after are these tiny bubbles that are scattered very diffusely through the shale and are actually trapped inside of it, and the only way to get it out is to blow the shale up. So water then becomes the agent by which you do that, and you need massive amounts of water. In New York, in the Marcellus Shell, which is the data I know the best, um, we, we would be using one to six million gallons of water per frack, um, and each well can be fracked up to 10 times, and you can have up to six wells on a wellhead. So you're talking about one wellhead consuming millions and millions of gallons of water, maybe up to a billion. Um, so that's not a trivial amount. Um, and even though we also live in a Great Lake state that's very watery, um, that if that, and of course the, in, the drilling company, the water's very heavy, it weighs eight pounds a gallon, so you don't want to transport it from too far away because you have to burn all that diesel and all those tanker trucks just to bring the water on site. And so they will look for the nearest source of water. And if that's a, a groundwater aquifer, they will drain down the aquifer. If it's a creek, they will use water from the creek even if the creek flows dry. And even in Pennsylvania across the border where they're fracking uh, quite a lot. We've seen, um, in which also a watery state, uh, we've seen uh, creeks run dry and wells go dry because of the loss of, of fracking. Um, and so to put a number on it, um, you, you put about half of the water that you inject down into the ground is gone forever. So you're destroying the water because you're removing it from the hydrological cycle, right? The, the, gr the, wa the gr groundwater and rain are inter intertwined, right? You all know that the wheel of water that's been forever turning the water cycle that you memorized in seventh grade. So the rain comes down, it falls on the ground, it, like a curtain of moisture goes into the groundwater aquifer, these lenses of water buried under the ground. Eventually, uh, artesian springs bring it back up to the surface. It becomes creeks and rivers. It flows out to the ocean. It rises again as water vapor, and it goes around like that. And it spends some time as our blood and our tears and our cerebral spinal fluid, if we drink it, and we pee it back into the lake <coughs> and so on. So the same water's been going around and around since the beginning of time. So this is the only time in human history that, that we as people have ever made water disappear mm -hmm. by taking it and burying it deep in the earth, under the earth, far below the water table. It will never be part of the hydrologic cycle again. And so that's what we're seeing out west. We've buried so much water now that we have created these droughts that may be permanent. So that is going to be interesting to see how that plays out because at the same time we've entrenched uh, all, all the kind of sunk costs of fracking, all the steel pipes that have been laid, all these investments that have been made, they have to keep fracking in order to keep the investors happy and yet they're running out of water, could have been foreseen it wasn't and now they're coming east 
um, for our gas and for our, and we have more water, and so that's very attractive to them. All right, from my point of view, here in the watery areas of the East, burying the water and losing it forever, even though philosophically and ethically I think it's obscene, the bigger public health point of view is what happens to the half of the water that comes flying back up with the gas. Because then that, that's called the flowback water, and then that is what has to be permanently disposed of. And there's so much of it, we don't know where to put it. So the best practices is to re-inject it back into the ground, um, but not in a shale formation, in a sandstone formation. The sand, sandstone can kind of serve as a sponge that will, that will then absorb it. And, and the best sandstone around here is in Ohio. So Ohio then becomes the place where all of the frack wastewater from Pennsylvania, and if, God forbid, in New York we open ourselves to fracking, it will come from New York too. Presumably, I don't know about if you have sandstone in Michigan or not, if you too will export your frack water to northeastern Ohio, but in around Youngstown in that area where they have these uh, fracking injection wells, that's where you've seen a lot of earthquakes. So to summarize, fracking is associated with earthquakes a little bit because of fracking per se, but more when you re-inject the fracking waste. And you can see why, because a lot of the chemicals used in frac fluid are friction reducers, because it, the borehole is only five inches wide. And so when you're trying to put that 10,000 pounds per square inch of pressure on the shale to blow it up a mile below your feet, you can't lose that energy by friction. So you add a lot of slick, that's why it's called slick water. You add all these friction reducers. A lot of them are toxic too. Um, but when you re-inject all the fracking wastewater, it's got, still got all those friction reducers in it. And when you send it back down, it reduces the friction between geological strata. And so it allows rocks deep underground to slide across each other. And that's what earthquakes are, two rock layers that slide across each other. So you're lubing them up, allowing rock layers to move. And then you're getting <coughs> these earthquake swarms. And then lastly, um, those, um, you can prime the pump geologically in such a way that when a big earthquake happens, and this is what we saw um, in the southwest, a big earthquake happened in Chile, and the underground seismic waves could travel all the way up to places like Oklahoma, where you've buried a lot of frac waste, and then because they're, um, so all the rock formations now have no friction and they're free to move, then they vibrate almost like a tuning fork in response to an earthquake that was thousands of miles away. And so the question then, for, and the people of Ohio are also committing civil disobedience, right, over these fracking wastewater disposals. And we want to stand in solidarity with them too because they're not getting any of the advantage of fracking, the, the financial advantage of, you know, royalties or jobs. Uh, all they're doing is getting the waste under their communities and their property values are going down. They're suffering from earthquakes and, and, and so on. And so if we want to stop that, we need to close the doors to fracking here in Michigan as well. <coughs> Um, I don't know what to do here. There's some more people than I have time to answer. So can I give the last word to the, uh, the, the Michigan band group just so we can hear what, what they're doing? And I'll be happy to stand around. And um, uh, I'm, I'm going to be here for some part of the afternoon. And I'll, I'll be, if you have questions, please come up and ask me individually. Thanks, Sandra. Um, this is Luann Cosma. Oh, hi, Luann. Nice to meet, we meet you at finally. Last. <laughs> yeah. I started a group called Band Michigan Fracking about two years ago. And I think I put your video up there. And, um, Maybe three whole years ago I put it up there. So it's really nice to meet you finally. Um, two years ago we started a group called uh, L Committee to Ban Fracking in Michigan, and it's a ballot initiative committee. It's uh, a direct democracy um, activity. So we don't uh, lobby our senators and representatives or the governor, but we are doing it ourselves. So we wrote the law the way we would like to see it uh, written which is to ban horizontal fracking and the waste that are generated by horizontal hydraulic fracturing no matter where it's done so we don't get Ohio's wastes. Right now we are taking in our own wastes. We have, uh, about three years ago we only had two wells. Now we've got 53 permitted wells and the entire lower peninsula will be fracked if we don't stop uh, this madness. Um, two years ago we started for an, an amendment to the Constitution we collected 30,000 signatures for that and didn't get it on the ballot in 2012. Uh, last year, we collected 70,000 signatures, which is a lot of people. It would fill all of Spartan Stadium, if you could picture that. But we need four times that many people in order to get it on the ballot. And then eventually, we need 2.5 million people to vote yes to ban fracking. So we have a long way to go. Uh, we didn't get it on the ballot for 2014 yet. Uh, right now, we plan to 
uh, go for the 2016 ballot. And what it also does is go after the, the law the way it's written right now says that part 615 of the rules and regulations of the state, the state statute that governs how we frack in this state, um, the Department of Environmental Quality is required to foster the, in, the gas industry and oil industry along the most favorable conditions and with a view to the ultimate recovery of the maximum production of oil and gas. So DEQ is not supposed to you know, decide whether or not to frack, it is supposed to frack. And that's the case in many other states. So we're trying to change both you know, banning fracking, banning frack wastes, and changing that uh, construction of part of Part 615. Um, there are over 1,300 uh, 1, injection wells in Michigan. We're going to need many, many more. Our state is using more water per frack than any other state that we're aware of. 21 million gallons of water per frack, and the new ones are going to be 31 million. Um, legally, there are a couple of lawsuits in the, the state. I'll just mention a couple. Um, my husband, who is an attorney, just got um, a judge to stop 13 frack wells in this area here against Encana, just a temporary injunction. Um, another group down here is trying to stop um, the mineral rights, uh, uh, trying to stop fracking in some state parks down there. There are lawsuits like that. And then local ordinances really need to uh, pick up also. There's a group called CELDEF that does local ordinances, and there's a group called FLOW. They have two different approaches. If you have any questions about the ballot initiative, I'd be happy to answer them later. And we're looking for volunteers. We'd love everyone to be involved in it. We need a lot of people. We had 550 people. Uh, we could probably use three, four times that many. And we need money. OK, thank you. You're my hero, Luann. So uh, to close us out here, I'll, um, I want to address kind of the youth in the audience. I'm so pleased to see so many young women um, and that's where my hope comes from is the work that you're doing and uh, as I always say to on, when I speak on college campuses that you all have different skill sets you all are majoring in different things and we need all of those skill sets to solve this problem I mean the one kind of hopeful thing about being faced with an overwhelmingly huge problem um, if you cannot give in to despair over the size and the magnitude of the problems that we face is that it, it's not your job alone to solve it. It's going to take all of us, right? And it's, we need engineers, but we need writers, and we need people who know how to design websites. Um, my husband is a visual artist, and he's interested in engaging the visual arts community and so forth. So the way I see this is that we are all musicians in this great human orchestra. It really is time to play the Save the World Symphony. You don't have to play solo. But you do have to know what instrument you play and play it as well as you can and find your place in the score. You know, this, is our, uh, this shale is our Greensboro lunch counter for our generation. Hope you don't mind me at age 55 putting myself in your generation. But this is the task that we are faced with. My dad had to go off and defeat global fascism in World War II. And when he was 18, shipped off to Europe run by Hitler, he was scared and it looked like an overwhelming task. And he was up against German panzer tanks, which were much more powerful than anyone thought. And it was supposed to be the thousand year reign. And, but he let me know, um, I grew up in a very conservative household, Rock River Republican. He let me know, you know, when you have a name like Steingraber, you can't be a good German. That's not your job. Your job is, if you see a problem, to go out and do something about it. It doesn't matter if you think it's winnable or not. You simply do the right thing. And by doing the right thing, you inspire other people. And pretty soon, it's not so overwhelming anymore. That's a conservative value. That's the banner under which I fight. I bring this kind of Churchillian <laughs> determination to you know, fighting on the beaches, fighting in the landing gear, fighting uh, in the streets, wherever it takes. Just take one battle at a time and we can't we need every single one of you in this room and whatever resources you have to bear I'm not asking you to do small things I'm asking you to do big things bring everything you have all the money you have all the time you have to put your shoulder to the wheel um, but we in, in so doing we become the heroes we become the people whose pictures you know little postage stamp pictures will appear uh, in the history books about the people who close the door on this brutal Neanderthal method of using fresh water, fresh drinking water, to smash rocks apart, to, to, to get fossil fuels out so we could light them on fire. That is a terrible, brutish technology. It's time to end that and, and insist that we carry around these incredible telecommunications devices. We have whole libraries in our pockets. We store data in iClouds. 
you know, we're not investing in rotary dial forms or s phones or selectric typewriters. We're, uh, we're rolling out new technology in telecommunications. We can power those devices with the sun. We can power them with wind power. I mean, we don't have to keep lighting fossils on fuel to make, to run and, and be able to turn the lights on. The, that day is at hand, and it's our task now to be the midwives to bring that day at hand. It's not going to be an easy fight, but it's an incredibly meaningful fight, and it's made my life actually incredibly happy. So thanks. Thank you, Dr. Steingraber. We are so um, inspired, I hope, by your courage and thankful for it as well. We need um, more women on this fight and, and hopefully tonight, today, is a beginning to that effort. I want to take a moment to highlight another leader on these issues. Um, Stephanie Maybe is here from Kent County Water Conservation. She and uh, well, Kent County Water Conservation, WEMIAC, Freshwater Future, Sierra Club, and several other partners <coughs> will be kicking off some work on fracking um, in local communities here in West Michigan and also in the Kalkaska Charlevoix area this spring. Stephanie will be organizing in local communities. So if you are, uh, are in uh, the West Michigan region in particular, and you are interested in moving your community forward, please connect with her. This is not an either or battle, it's an if and, and we need to be prepared for everything. We need to be, uh, all of these organizations need to begin to weave together this work uh, to make sure that we are well protected from these impacts. We um, have some, some women to honor, and I'd like to, uh, to bring up Lori and Lori. <laughs> Lori Baker is with us from Baker Spindler Holtz. She is one of West Michigan's 50 most influential women and a, a wonderful uh, friend of Weemiak's and an activist. Lori Gard Gardner is the quintessential citizen at large, <laughs> a longtime uh, education activist and um, an arts activist who is also very passionate about environmental issues. And they've worked on our committee to help us um, to honor some of the women in our community who uh, continue to inspire our work. So I'll hand it over to them. Thank you. I think we should thank Josh because without him, none of us would be here today. <laughs> um, thank you, and thank you so much for your comment, Sandra. Um, interesting comment you closed with, um, one battle at a time, is probably the perfect segue to recognize our hidden heroines because I think that's, that was really the essence of why this honor was established a few years ago for this symposium. And um, so we want to take some time today to celebrate the environmental movement and the ideology that we share as people of all races and genders and walks of life. Um, today we've grieved work that has not been done, very evidently, and we've been inspired to affect that change. Uh, however, we don't, don't want to leave without honoring the work that is ongoing by the hidden heroines of our community. Um, the women who are receiving the awards today are really amazing women, um, and they give everything they have. Uh, they have defended our soils, our watersheds, our ecosystems. They've chosen to care for the unseen. They've spoken for those who cannot speak for themselves, and they've inspired others to act. 
We want to celebrate this work and the work that the world sees as too insurmountable or ineffectual, but that we as environmental leaders and citizens of the earth and stewards of its resources have, have seen and felt. We want to thank all of those who have nominated um, peers or co-workers, co bosses or teachers or mothers. Um, we want to thank you for taking the time, because it does take time when you want to um, recognize someone for their efforts. Um, the Hidden Heroines, so we can in turn point to their hard work and their dedication and revel in the things that we that they have loved and defended, championed and accomplished. And so with that, I will turn it over to the other Lori to uh, present the award. Thank you, Lori. Can't get us confused. I want to make sure that everybody takes a minute to look in their program because we have listed everyone who was nominated. And having been for the second year involved in this committee, I am just always blown away by what you all are doing out there. And there are so many hidden heroines, people that I have not heard of, um, that all deserve to be recognized. So please, if you see any of these women in the audience, thank them for what they're doing. So the first award that we're going to give today is entitled The Women of Vision. And it's given to a woman whose leadership helped to build a foundation for later efforts that have resulted in positive impacts on the environment. And the way we do these awards is we ask the nominator to come up and speak a little bit about the person who's going to win the award because we find that quite often um, the, the winners of the awards don't, they're humble. They don't always tell you everything that you should know about them. So I'd like to first invite to the stage someone you've already heard speak very eloquently and that's Mary Alice Williams from the Nokomis Foundation. She is the nominator for the Women of Vision Award. met uh, Kim Spring uh, when both of us were very much younger and she was <laughs> much younger than I was. Um, we were uh, as a family uh, setting out for uh, a walk one spring evening, the kind of spring evening we're all longing for right now. And um, Kim approached our door and she settled herself on the wing wall of our front steps and started talking about water, fresh water, the Great Lakes, and the mission uh, of clean water action. And she described it with a passion uh, and a, an intellectual knowledge that was quite startling and amazing and wonderful. And um, she wanted us to become a part of, of her efforts. And it was absolutely impossible to resist. So, you know, they, you know, they had the clipboards, they had the little brochures, they, they didn't have a jar, but it was a, a metaphorical jar that they wanted some money in. And um, we supported her. It would have been impossible um, not to. And a couple of weeks later, one of my children was at the end of the known world that she was allowed to go to on her tricycle. And she came home all excitedly and said, Mom, I saw that lady who cares about the water. <laughs> and so in our household from that point on, Kim, Kim always was that lady who cares about the water. But she cares about a lot of things. She cares about community. As the director of Clean Water Action, you would frequently get a call from her at the oddest time saying she needed six more bodies for a phone bank. And when you got there, you wondered how she thought six more bodies could fit into the small space that she had to run a phone bank from. But it was to Kim that people looked for guidance about um, the candidates who really were working with integrity on the issues that she represented. And she has, for all of these years, uh, been an unsung heroine in our community, quietly doing the work, effectively doing the work, and doing the work that she wanted other people to do. Kim has never not rolled up her sleeves um, and done the work herself under very difficult circumstances. And of all the people I know, and I know a lot of really good people, Kim probably lives out 
um, in her life and her lifestyle, uh, the what she talks about. She leaves a very small uh, carbon footprint and has been doing that long before we even knew to call it a carbon footprint. So I am delighted um, to have nominated her, I'm delighted that she won. And um, Kim, congratulations, you are and continue to be a woman of vision. And she's doing it now through her own firm, Spring Forward Consulting. So if you need a strong voice, uh, Kim is the person to, to go to. So not my thing. I'm a behind the curtain kind of person. Um, and But I do want to say a few things that I think are really important because I can't believe I'm standing at the same podium with Sandra St Steengraber, who is the Rachel Carson of, of our time as far as I'm concerned. But I also want to dismiss in terms of you don't have to be a PhD to make a difference and care about the environment. You can put it in your own words, you can do it in your own terms. You can give 10 bucks to a candidate that you know is a pro-environment candidate. You can join, I would say, not in any order, WEMIAC, the Sierra Club, and Clean Water Action are the best, most solid environmental groups in the state of Michigan, and they're also federal in some cases. Um, but if you do have a little more je ne sais quoi, run for office. Even if you run for library commissioner, if you're progressive, there are groups out there that will support you. I know the Progressive Women's Alliance will, because I'm part of it. <laughs> you can start small and build up. You don't have to do all the research and everything else. Find organizations that you can trust get a little of information and then act on it. Whether you sign a petition online, which takes about 30 seconds, or you get out there yourself, like Ruth Kelly and others have done, and run for office, that takes a lot of guts and a lot of bravery. Um, but there's people like me who want to be behind the curtains and want to support you. Um, and talk to other people, even if you don't think they agree with you and you don't have to go into a lot of detail, clean water, good. <laughs> Dirty water, bad. <laughs> Solar power, good. Fracking, bad. And you don't have to do a lot more. Tell people, go do your own research. You know, you don't have to be an expert. Um, I love people like Dr. Steengraber because she gives the basis of support when we have to go testify before Congress and all this other crap, <laughs> produce a white paper and all this data um, to back up what we're saying, clean water, good, dirty water, bad, but don't feel like you have that pressure. You can make a lot of difference in many little ways. Thank you so much. is entitled Woman of Inspiration, and it's given to a woman at the forefront of the current environmental movement. Now, having learned from those before them, she inspires us daily to continue our advocacy. I love that word. We've got to do more of it. So I'd like to bring to the stage the nominator for this award, Renee Hasselink from Nichols. Thank you. Um, well, I've known Chris for, I think it's been about two years, and I met her through some of the work that I do with the Green School Movement in the U.S. Green Building Council. So it didn't take me long to figure out that Chris was a go-getter. So I just wanted to share with you some of the things that she's accomplished, and she wears two hats at Mona Shore School District. Um, she's a, her full-time is um, in the IT department, and then she also, a couple of years ago, was asked to um, 
head up their energy efforts, their energy reduction efforts. So that's when I met Chris. So in that time frame, she has, they formed a green team that consists of staff, students, parents, and community members. Um, and I'll save the one till the last because that's my favorite story to tell. Uh, they started a district-wide recycling program for paper, plastics, cardboard, the normal things. And last year, or just out of the middle school actually, recycled about 5,400 pounds of paper. Uh, they started a community garden, so they have uh, four, 12, 4 by 12 raised beds, and I, I know I saw a lot, of, a lot of activity going on there last year. They um, started some real food cooking classes for kids and parents. Um, she works with their ecology classes. Um, just on the energy conservation program, since February of 2012, they've saved $180,000 on their energy um, bills in, in the school district. So my favorite story to tell, though, is um, their elimination of styrofoam from their lunch program. Uh, Chris, you know, she's a visual person, so she was making a, pre their team was making a presentation to the school board to convince them to do away with styrofoam in the, in the lunch program. So they collected all of the styrofoam plates or platters that, from one day and rolled them in to the school board meeting to show. <laughs> so, so, you know, it can be done. You know, a lot of our schools think that that's such a, a hard effort to do, but um, just talk to Chris. They made it happen, so I think it was this past fall. They went to paper-based products so they could compost those. Uh, so she continues to inspire, you know, a lot of people in her school district as well as our community. So, Chris, um, I'm happy to be celebrating this day with you. This also is not my thing, but that last one will be kind of hard to follow up. <laughs> um, I wanted to thank Renee for nominating me. Um, I was just telling her that we don't do this to get noticed, but it really is nice when people notice what you're doing. Um, I want to thank my husband for not only listening to all my crazy ideas, but he actually helps me make them a reality. Um, and to the Environmental Action Council for this, for this award. Um, it's an honor just to be recognized by an organization such as this. Um, it's nice to know that people appreciate what we're doing. And sometimes the only voices you hear are the negative ones. You tend to hear those more than the positive ones. The, um, the criticisms tend to come out more than the compliments. So um, receiving this just confirms that we're on the right path and inspires me to keep going. So thank you. I have to tell you, the committee loved the styrofoam oh, thing too, the visual. The end to that story is that um, had bags and bags of garbage from lunch. And at the end of the presentation, one of the school board members said to me, can you take that with you on the way out? It really stinks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, the third award. It's entitled The Women of Hope. And it's given to an up-and-coming advocate who brings hope, a fresh voice, and an understanding of the diverse perspectives which speak to the ongoing efforts to improve the environment. And this is, I think it's going to be a special one. I'm bringing up Sean Fahey from Steel Cra Steelcase Corporation to give the award to his wife. I love that. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just to start off, I, I want to apologize to Katie because I sort of kept it a secret until she found out this morning that I had nominated her for this award. So, sorry about the last minute surprise. <laughs> So I just want to give you a little bit of background on, on uh, where Katie's been up, up to now. Um, you know, we just heard from two amazing women who have done uh, so much already in the roles that they're in, and um, I just know that uh, there's a lot for Katie's future. So um, 
In 2010, Spartan Stores created their first position focused solely on sustainability, and they hired Katie Rogala, now Katie Fahey, as their first sustainability intern. She jumped into the position with ambition and with lots of ideas, and she helped Spartan to conduct a sustainability assessment, calculate their carbon footprint, um, and, and lots of other things uh, to find out where their biggest opportunities were. Over the last few years, Katie's been working closely with the leadership at Spartan to craft a sustainability strategy for the organization and to start to implement some of her ideas. Katie created a robust recycling program for about 100 retail stores and four distribution centers in Michigan and has piloted a composting program for their organic waste. She also helped Spartan open up their first LEED certified grocery store right here in West Michigan. A founding board member for the Women's Inclusion Network at Spartan Nash, uh, the new company name after merging with Spartan, uh, sorry, Nash Finch. A founding board member um, of the Women's Inclusion Network, she's a source of inspiration for other women at the company who aspire to make this world a more uh, equitable and a better place. Katie's only beginning her career, but as Spartan Nash's first and only sustainability coordinator, she's already accomplished so much. She brings a fresh, fresh perspective to the grocery retail industry and is an outstanding advocate for sustainability. I, I didn't nominate Katie for this award because she's my wife or because I love her to pieces, <laughs> even though both of those things are true. I nominated Katie because I've known her since we started in the sustainable business program at Aquinas College, uh, since we were freshmen. And I've watched her grow and I've watched her um, I watched her develop her passion for the environment and live it out. Um, she is passionate about the environment. She's passionate about equality and diversity. And I've seen her in several leadership roles already. And I know that she has a great passion for affecting change. She truly wants to make this world a better place for you and for me and for our future generations. I'm incredibly proud of everything that she's done and I know that she will continue to do great things in the future. So please help me welcome this year's recipient for Woman of Hope, Katie Fahey. taken aback because um, thank you for saying those si such nice things, Sean. Uh, wish you could say them more often. <laughs> just kidding. Um, wow. I was like, I have, oh, I'm ruining all this. Um, I have no idea who nominated me, da, da, da. And Sean's just like, oh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. And uh, so anyways, um, I just want to start off with saying thank you so much to Wemiak and to Grand Valley for throwing this event. Um, is everybody having a good time? Yeah. I think it's really excellent. And, um, to everybody, I know it always takes a lot of effort to put on these things, so thank you so much. Um, and I still can't believe that I uh, also got to get to share this stage with so many amazing women um, and this room and even West Michigan. There are so many people who are willing to step out on a limb and to help you and to take the time to um, really uh, invest in fellow people and especially women so I think this is a really great community um, I'm trying to remember what I was going to say <laughs> um, being the recipient of an award that says that the community around you that you so respect wants you or believes in you and thinks that you can make change is just such a cool thing it's a very cool and very surreal because I feel like so many times in our jobs or with what we're passionate about, you're like working so hard and you're so focused on what you're doing and um, it kind of feels like you're just hoping for any even little centimeter of change or progress, let alone an inch. And then you finally, um, and, and you just don't feel super accomplished, but you know there's that little voice inside of you that's like, no, this, this matters and you're making change happen and this will lead to great things if you don't give up. And I feel like this award is like you guys hearing that little voice in me and saying like, yeah, you, you can't give up. We're all in this together and, and 
you can make a difference. And so having that and having uh, a community that supports that is just so wonderful. So thank you so much. Um, there have been a lot of great women in uh, and, and uh, organizations in West Michigan that I'd just like to say thank you to really quickly. Aquinas College has a sustainable business program. Dr. Sekety, who's here with us, and Dr. Tuith um, have created a program that allows young professionals to have the kind of diverse experience that you need where you can go into a company as a junior in college and convince them that they need to invest in sustainability. How cool is that? How much preparation does that take? It? While you're in it, you might think that you're going to die and like never <laughs> see sunlight again, but you do and, and it helps you be actionable on the things that you care about. And um, I can never thank them enough. And the Center for Sustainability too supported, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Power Shift or gone, I see somebody was wearing a shirt. So yeah, in 2007, I got to do that and started um, a club at campus based off of that. But we wouldn't have gone without that funding and being part of the political process and talking to your legislators is such a unique opportunity, especially as a 19 year old, so thank you. Um, two individuals who have really helped me within this or community are Kelly Losey at Cascade Engineering. Um, just a dynamic woman. I don't know if anybody knows her. I'm sure a lot of you do. Um, and she's just one of those people who when she says, if you ever need anything, she means it. She will get you research. She'll help you with data. She'll sit down and talk with you about theory. It's, she's an amazing woman and has opened me up to so many opportunities. And Carrie Bliss from Padnos um, also is another amazing resource who I have found who um, if I could ever be half of the woman that she is or do half of the things that she does, I will feel extremely accomplished in my life. And lastly, uh, my husband, <laughs> I wanted to thank um, before I even knew he was doing this, but uh, Sean is also in the sustainability field and having somebody to stay up with and argue with at three in the morning about the best way to talk about strategic policy for companies <laughs> related to sustainability, um, it's so, uh, priceless. I just, it's a, an amazing feeling and the best support system I could ever ask for. So um, I guess just overall, thank you so much and thank you for this community. And I think um, maybe if we could all just, I, it's already been echoed a couple times, so I don't need to repeat it, but I will. We all have our own roles and we all, no matter whether you're an educator, a scientist, a community advocate, a politician, a mother, a student, whatever, we all contribute to each other too. And, and you might not think that you have an impact on other people, but you truly do. And uh, the people watching you really appreciate it. So thank you. <laughs> oh. I, sorry, this was like the huge middle part of my speech. Spartan Nash, Spartan Stores, <laughs> their leadership team, their CEO, the Sustainability Committee, um, giving a chance again to a 19 year old to, to make a difference and to say, hey, like craft this strategy and we will support you and we'll give you funding and we'll um, <laughs> let you be the change you wish to see in the world is invaluable. So they are really um, a great company and with our recent merger, there are gonna be wonderful things happening. So make sure you watch out for that. Thank you. I do have to say Aquinas grads rock. I'm an Aquinas grad. Anyway, <laughs> congratulations to our, our three honorees and to all of our hidden heroines who are out there. You all know who you are, every one of you. Um, all of our heroines who were nominated by their family and their friends and their colleagues and their husband. <laughs> Your contributions are noteworthy and they positively impact all of us. So again, thank you for your passion, your fearlessness, and your unbeatable work ethic. And for building beaches and parks, restaurants and schools, houses, businesses that have concern about the future of our communities and the health of our planet, and for knowing good work when you see it and going after it. So let's give another hand to our honorees and to all of our nominees as well. slower than we anticipated, about five minutes behind, which isn't significant. Um, 
we would like the uh, action or er, citizen action panelists to to join us and we'll move right into that panel discussion feel free if you need to to take a break stretch move around um, come closer to the circle uh, this last panel is um, is where we really begin to to move from learning and inspiration into action and so it's where we put all of our hands together and, uh, and begin to make change. Um, so we'll, if I believe Jamie Scripps is here to facilitate this discussion and we'll just have a moment of shifting around and get started again.